Carter, who stars as Princess Margaret, and series director Jessica Hobb. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, congratulations to everyone on your Emmy nominations. You're in the third season of a great series and it just keeps getting better. But Peter, do you feel any pressure going into a new season when every season before is so heralded? Uh, well, it's, it's very kind of you to put it like that. I, uh, I, I'm sort of still in the tunnel and um, I, I'm sure the other showrunners you talk to will say the same. You're in a sort of sleep deprived, baggy eyed tunnel. And uh, and you uh, you don't really have the chance to step back and and reflect about it, which is probably quite good because I don't have a chance to get nervous about it. You're so busy doing what you're doing, uh, and um, and and the the joy of it, I suppose, is that there is such a tight group of you, um, and it's such a it's such a team endeavor. So uh, I, I'm not in it alone. I'm curious for uh, our two new cast members, um, when you were approached about joining The Crown, were you already a fan? And, and what were sort of your feelings about stepping into these uh, already, you know, established roles on such a beloved show? Well, I was a big fan of the show, so I was terribly excited. I very rarely spend an awful lot of time considering anything. <laughs> so I said, yes, please. And uh, um, I've had an absolute ball. I really genuinely have. And we've finished obviously season four now, and, and when suddenly you feel really sad that it's not going to be us anymore. We had such a, oh, such a beautiful time. Every day going to work was an absolute treat. Really loved it. I felt very nervous though, because you know, Claire Foy was, in my head still is, <laughs> the, the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor, for you? Well, I had, I was very nervous. I was very, very scared. Um, and I was a big fan. And um, like Holly, I knew that the standard was very high and it was much beloved, the show. And I was very conscious that sometimes you, you know, people fall in love with the actor and the face. And I just thought, oh, what are they going to, are they going to feel betrayed by us two popping up and taking this on? And um, I love the fact that we were being employed to be our, actually we weren't originally, to be our age, I was going to say, because we, we had to pretend to be a lot younger, so we were on crash diets and... <laughs> um, but um, but I love more Peter's sort of thing was that you really can't beat aging. You can you know we can slap on some rubber onto our faces and make the creases, but the dents inside that's something, and the experience of actually living was something that we were employed to do. So and I felt like oh thank God we're not we're allowed to be middle aged. Um, um, and uh, but it wasn't until I saw Peter's script that I thought I've got to do it. Um, because in abstract, I thought I, I, I needed pointers and I knew, and any actor knows that you only need to be as good as what's on the page. And, um, and now two years on, it's funny when you said new cast, I feel like we're very much the old cast. We're yeah. Very sad. Left. It's two years of our life. It's just gone. And I felt it's one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. On many, many levels. But that's not because, you know, this is, this is genuine feeling and not just empty compliment. But, um, it was such a brilliant and expert team. And Morgan Peters Wright, it's his name is absolutely, it's, it's out of his, he's the main architect of it. But there is such an amazing team that supports us all. And I've never felt so supported and um, so well run. It was like being in a, in a high club, you know, um, just a, a great cruise ship holiday for two years. And now <laughs> we get back to life where the um. Bumps and, but, um Anyway, and also there's a great luxury, I'm banging on a bit, um, but the great luxury of being able to have, to be on this, to be with the same character for two years, over a two year period, because obviously we're off and on, but that's never, I've never had that before. I've never had, and nothing beats time and allowing it just to sit. And Peter said something, do you remember you said that after the second read through, he said, God, you're so much better this time around for all of you. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you're right, but... Because we've lived with them for a year, you know, and we're not so anxious. And also, we can trust ourselves to, for the characters, for the Queen, for Margaret, for Prince Philip to show up on the day. Because at the beginning, you're just like going, Jesus, where are you? When we first started coming, when we first had the idea, all of us, about doing it, and, and, and that it would be two seasons um, per cast as it were to travel through 60 years so it's about 10 10 years a season approximately is the speed at which this train is traveling and 
Um, I hadn't thought through uh, really in any detail. It, um, I just knew that you'd have to have other actors as people get older. And, um, and, and I, felt, I, I felt nervous about whether, the, you know, when you pass the baton, whether, whether an audience would accept it. Uh, I, I'm now confident because of what uh, you know, Olivia and Helena and, and their fellow cast members have done, that people will accept it. Um, but I think there's something quite interesting about it for the actors, I think. I think that sort of two years is long enough for it to feel like a, like a really permanent job and it's short enough not to drive you crazy. And, and you know... <laughs> and drive everyone else crazy. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, I, I, I and I, I can see, I can see. It's it's a pleasure to watch the sort of you know um, them go through the business of trying to get to know their character, understand their character, and that that keeps all the rest of us all quite excited and on our toes as well. And so it, it rejuvenates us. So where we would otherwise have had a third season slump of energy, perhaps, or a sense of fatigue, the fact that you're suddenly surrounded by a whole lot of new people who are quite nervous, it makes you feel like that too. And, 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 it, and it makes the process of the long distance run much easier and, and more pleasant. And Jessica, in a sense, you're also new to the show this season. You you came in and you directed two episodes, including the finale, which I feel like is a lot of pressure to put on somebody who's who's sort of new to the show. <laughs> it's true. Although Peter was very generous, he gave us choices about which episodes, and I loved this episode in particular. And I'd wanted to work with Helena. I'd worked with Olivia before, which was just a joy. So I knew that was going to be good. But I was really kind of aching to work with Helena. And when I read what Peter had written, I just thought, oh, this is brilliant. It was that and the astronauts one with a paired together. And I just thought two of them were exceptional scripts. So I was very keen. Were you also a fan of the series coming into it? Yes, well, I'm going to be really honest. Before I actually watched it, I was, I was almost had convinced myself it wasn't going to be for me because it was the hottest ticket in town and everywhere else you were shooting, they had all the money, they had all the lights. And I was like, I was so jealous of what they got to do. And then I turned it on and literally you see Claire Foy's face and then John Lithgow appears as Churchill. And I was like, any show that casts him as Churchill, I'm in. It was just, <laughs> yeah. and I never looked back. I just, I, that first episode for me still has such incredible joy in it. It's great. Peter, going into the third season, what was it you knew you wanted to highlight? There's, there's so much material, but you also have a couple seasons left. How do you decide what period of time to cover and what significant events to cover? Well, the decision about which events to cover is always, uh, that's quite a long part of the process. And so, you know, the reductive nature of history is such that you, you look at a decade and, and, and the, lo the further away we get from the decade, the more we reduce it to about two or three incidents. And so for most people, the 60s are sort of England won the World Cup and uh, then there was a sexual revolution. And, and maybe if you're in the United States, JFK was shot in the early part of the 60s. So uh, you suddenly think, well, you know, actually, let's, have, let's make a trade-off here between the things that we need to put in, the signature events of a decade, that you need to put in in order for it, not, for it not to be perverse. But then can we try a few different ones so that actually, uh, uh, you know, a decade gets a slightly better hearing uh, and, and you don't just ne necessarily follow the tried and tested landmark events that define a decade. And, uh, and to do that, we've got, as it were, the prism of going through the the characters in this family. Uh, yes, they are all, because it's the Queen, you know, and the royal family, they are all, they've all got ringside seats for every major event. But because each of them has yes. sort of their own private interests and passions, you, 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 you can look, you can take it in different directions. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, because uh, 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 s someone like Prince Philip, it made sense to me because of what I knew about his character that he would take particular interest in certain aspects of the uh, lunar mission, which is why I put the Apollo uh, program or the Apollo mission in. I would otherwise probably have left it out, but I could see a way of telling the story through him and a crisis of male middle age um, and, and, and things that you know, had been unachieved in his own life. Um, and I suddenly thought it, that way you can make it both a personal story, but also... It, 
a story about a, a moment in time or a landmark event in a decade and so forth. And Olivia and Helena, uh, you guys are so wonderful in these roles and your chemistry with each other is fantastic. Did you know each other at all before shooting? No. We've met once. We've met once. Yeah, we'd met once before and... Um, you both remember. Yes. And we got... Because <laughs> <laughs> we got hotel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I remember the dress you were wearing and everything. I thought, what oh, was it? It was a sleeveless black and it had a sort of fishtail thing at the back. <laughs> you remember this? I have to come over. I don't remember. <laughs> well, uh, I'll draw it for you. You'll remember. Um, uh, but yes, and then we met properly at the read through, did we? Having been uh, messaging each other. And. Um, I think, I'd like to say, I think we've become lifelong friends. We found it very easy, I think, to get on with each other. And uh, it, wasn't much yeah. we, it became quite sisterly. We were sort of, yeah, what? Um, okay, bumbling along. <laughs> bumbling along. <laughs> It's, a, it, it's, an, it's an apocryphal story, I don't know if it's true or not, that, that everybody, everybody who's played Salieri and everybody who's played Mozart over long yeah. periods of time ends up hating each other. And, and, and that because, because the, the parts are, are so, uh, 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 there's so much opposition and, and antagonism and rivalry, rivalry. and that, that it bleeds, uh, and, and I think it's not surprising actually that, that both you, both the two of you, I, I've noticed get very close throughout the I course of the glitched. Do Vanessa and um, what's it, Claire, do they still get on? Do they talk? They still talk all the time. They're still very, very oh, close. Okay. So we have long. okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were um, heading yeah. in a different direction when you started that yeah, story. Yeah, so did I. I thought, <laughs> of course. End up no, no, no. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a terrible paradigm, or whatever the word is. That was... <laughs> yeah. I, what, I mean is, yeah. what I mean is that part, parts can set up an antagonism or an empathy. And, and, uh, uh, or, uh, yeah. Yes. And, and, uh, and What's nice and, is, I mean, Colly, I have never had a sister, so, um, but I've always wanted one, so now I've got one. Oh. Yeah, oh, really? it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know, yeah, and honestly, it wasn't, it was singularly, I felt very, um, it was like just jumping into warm water. There wasn't any, we didn't really have to do much. It was just, it was, I think there no. was a sort of, um, um, just a, an immediate understanding. The other person. Yeah, and I just, but yeah, you, were properly, you were properly sisterly in mm -hmm. the sense that you did you did antagonise each other, you did wind each other up. It was great as as characters because I have lots yeah. of sisters and I felt that you guys really hit that note properly. You understood what it was. All the gloves are off. You can say anything you like to your sister because it's unconditional. That that love yeah. is there for life. You can get away with saying and and that's what I love the two of you bringing out in the characters. You really did, particularly in that. My last problem scene. actually. With the season three, my problem was that we didn't actually have that much to do um, in scene wise. It was only like there was this great, great scene at the end of uh, at the end of the season, at the end of that episode. But yeah. after that, I was kind of frustrated. I thought in my head we were going to have a lot more, and then I think that's rectified in season four. There's a lot more of that of their friendship, and um, a lot of the people that I met who knew Margaret, who uh, told me things, said that they were slightly frustrated by. The fact that in the with the first two seasons there wasn't enough of the closeness, which you now see in episode four of their of their of the sister of that relationship, they were incredibly close, and no two um, nobody else had had that same childhood, mm. Um, mm -hmm. and yes, there were all sorts of conflicts within it, but ultimately they were also incredibly close and very yeah. um, you know sympathetic, and Margaret was very loyal, yeah, very absolutely to a fault. When you guys are texting each other, I'm I'm curious. Do uh, uh, Helena is, is Olivia Coleman a big emoji user? Yeah, <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> I'm just very quick on responding. Really? She is. Uh, yeah. She's just on it very immediately. Fact, even before I press send, it's already come back. The answer. It's okay, very. Um, <laughs> she's also a real fund of anything organisational. If you're doing yeah. up a house, she knows exactly. If I was looking for a lampshade or something, because we do quite a lot apart from our in the in the hair and makeup we're doing because we're mothers and run households. Um, of course, we're own production managers, so there's a lot of the time where um, 
you know, exchanging like, uh, where did you get that? Uh, that I love that. If I don't get any more acting work ever again, I just want to, I want to go and work at Retruvius. It's a, have you ever seen? Well, I can't be there. I'll send you all the link to it. <laughs> As if you're not um, going to get any more acting work. That's a right. really wonderful right. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Olivia was also our, she's our social hub. Really? Anything social going on goes through Olivia. I'm just going to, yeah. All right. She knows everything that's going on behind the scenes and she organises everything. She's very good at bringing people together, aren't you? Oh, that's nice of you, Jess. Ah. I'm, I'm a very a responsible of... leader. She was a very good yeah. queen. Oh, I'm a good leader. company, really good, good company leader, yeah. Really good oh. company leader. Thanks, you any... guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm nice because uh, you are playing real people, which you both have experience with. Um, but how do you go about researching your roles? And was there anything you learned that surprised you? And have either of you ever met your counterparts? Uh, I've met the Queen. Um, well, when you say you've met the Queen, you know, I mean, we haven't sat on a sofa together and had a chat. It was in a long queue of people where you you curtsy and you move along. You know, you um, a medal. Uh, that was Princess Anne. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do in the in the in the lineup? When did you meet the Queen? Uh, that was um, a few years ago, I think. Uh, there was a, a a film industry evening at Windsor. Oh and, uh, yeah. I didn't Windsor. think she'd be there, and suddenly we all ended up in this sort of queue. And I thought, I wonder why we're in a big queue. <laughs> I thought it was just people using the rooms at Windsor for a sort of bash. And then suddenly we looked around the corner and went, oh, fuck. And, <laughs> and this, this man in epaulets was, was telling us what to do. Just a little bow, chin to chest, and uh, no, don't overdo it. And, and sort of shuffled us <laughs> forwards. It's uh, your majesty and then your royal highness. And, uh, and just keep moving, keep moving. Because she had hundreds of people to get through. Um, and that was it. So I can't say... That's not really a meeting, is it? <laughs> but um, that counts. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was at the same do, and I met Margaret. Well, it wasn't. Was it was well, I'm not sure if it was that. It was when the place had been burnt down and they had been restored. So they had a huge oh, no. art industry um, drinks. And I remember seeing Princess Margaret, who was tiny. I mean, she's much smaller than me, just alone. Oh, no, this, I, I was uh, later than that then, because she was already dead when I went. Yeah. I, I was in about 2014, I think. So this must have been all the history-wise. But anyway, I think it's probably um, 2000 or something. And she was very, um, very small, and I went up to her. And she um, kind of knew who I was because she knew my uncle very well. She said, and she said, oh, Helena, yes, you are getting better at acting. Um, <laughs> that, you told me that story, that's hilarious. And I just thought that is so inimitably her, which was basically a compliment put down. No, it wasn't really a compliment, was it? But it was... Not really. <laughs> I didn't really know what to... But, um, a handed compliment. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? That's it's a backhanded compliment. I'm getting, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting worse. I mean, I could have, she could have easily said that. So, um, if only you've been able to play in a few years from now, I'll be playing you. Yeah, now. it'll be in your interest, mate. So. I'm getting better. So, yes, and um, the uh, it was a real privilege to meet all that's what um, a lot of the friends that knew her, really knew her. And I think they were quite frustrated generally about her re reputation in the press. So they were very, very happy to talk to me and, and really sort of bring her into the room by, because they loved her and they miss her. And so they had lots of stories. And so I got a real, I did, I'm pretty um, exhausting in um, just asking questions. Um, quite difficult. And I've done it before playing somebody who's well known because you have to go past what everyone's received sort of opinion is or their prejudice in a way. So it's a really very conscious bias you know they've all, already worked out what they are and you've got to it's your responsibility well I feel it's my responsibility to try and find the essence of somebody the true person and um, definitely Margaret who was a victim of like a lot of prejudgment I think and, and bad opinion and she was much more complicated than she's been generally portrayed uh, and even by that book Ma'am Darling I thought it was very mono just like from one point of view 
So, and it was very easy once you started talking to people that in fact there were many, many, many more facets to her that nobody really wanted to know about. And a lot of, in some ways, all the positive doesn't really make good, good press. The two of you, um, you get, I mean, the whole cast, you get to wear these stunning costumes. And I was so thrilled to see that Amy Roberts was nominated for her work this yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> How much does that help you get into the character? I mean, you must feel like royalty wearing those. Do you have any, do you have any favorite items that you wanted to uh, make off with? Well, my favorite item was, uh, I, I like the clothes we wore in Scotland, but that's, that's not, they're, they're the least glamorous ones. <laughs> They were jumpers and woolly socks and, and brogues. Yeah, I think and the ones that she probably, the Queen, feels the most comfortable in, too. Yeah. Yeah. Not the only um, place to sort of dress according to her, what she actually likes. Yeah. In a way. But uh, I, I do think Amy, Amy and her team and Kate Makeup and her team did three quarters of my job for me. You know, if I turned up looking like this, it would, no one would believe I, I was the Queen. So they, they do so much for you and then... Uh, well, without them, it would be impossible to do it. And they're so brilliant at what they do. But I don't think I've been in something where I had a, a new costume per scene, practically. Yeah. There was a lot of standing, a lot of time was in um, costume makeup. So I've gone to know Amy very well and Sid, her daughter. And um, they're, they're indispensable because they've, they make your silhouette. In all honesty, and I think Margaret had the problem too, is that there's so many rules that the royals have to, you know, there's, obey when it comes to their clothes they aren't necessarily um an expression of the, themselves also your 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 talk your, your their job as costumers is to to indicate to the to the viewer what year you're in so sometimes you feel like i really don't like pleats and you say well you're wearing pleats because that's the 80 that is the fashion you know and um there, there was a an, and sort of traditionally often on a job you what you'll do is you build a wardrobe and then from that pick a costume but it, there was no question of doing that and Amy's very forceful and I'm sometimes quite strong-minded because unless I feel right in a costume <laughs> I feel like I'm to deliver so we often had clashes and I say can't I just wear the same thing I mean she didn't have the real mark right it didn't have a huge budget and she said no no no, absolutely not you're wearing this and just get on with it and it was like um but then I realized Love of course that like Margaret a lot of the time she was that was her uniform you know same with the wig. I just thought, can't we change it up a bit? I mean, they wear the same hairdo every time, but that's their job. They have to be recognisable shapes and icons. And I've never been so grateful to a wig, ever. It's like you pop it on and then you just say, okay, done. Then. You know, we just have to make sure we don't fall over. And um, a lot of the, it's, it's done. You love what you wore on Mystique. Hmm? Helen, you love what you wore on Mystique, didn't you? You love, that's the one thing I you love, did really Yeah, I loved all the stuff that she wore in private, which were loose, yeah. basically. You know, because a lot of the time she was really trussed up and um, very, um, it was, they weren't actually flattering lines for somebody so short. And, um, and I'm pretty short. Vanessa's just a, elegant, you know, she's a, a deer of length and elegance. And actually Margaret, and getting to know her, she really resented the fact she was short. Mm. She did everything to make herself taller. She had a ridiculous crown for her wedding. Her high, hair went higher and higher. She even got the the chair, you know, the, the, the seat on her, in her car raised. So she was, um, yeah, visible. And her visibility was a problem, particularly in crowds, because even her legs in waiting would, wouldn't know where she was. Because she was so, um, <laughs> she was so tiny. And then sometimes the waiter would turn around and, and hit her by mistake, you know, which she didn't really like. Uh, Olivia, <laughs> you, you've gotten so at home in a crown. We've seen you uh, in different roles um, pulling that off, and you wear it so well. Um, I think some, something people might not know is, aren't those heavy and hard to wear? Well, we have um, stage versions. So <laughs> <laughs> but they, they make them, so they copy them, but obviously they make them in lighter material because the, the real crown famously oh, heavy. Cost, sorry? It's a it was, neck yeah. So she had to practice um, before her coronation just to try and strengthen her neck and sort of, you know, because she had to sit still for hours wearing, and it weighs how many pounds or something? I think it's enormous. It's very, very heavy. I mean, that's really horrible, isn't it? So, no, we yeah. are a, a piece of cake. <laughs> they, they can dig a bit, but um, yeah, we're, we're <laughs> easy. Uh, there's a couple specific episodes I want to talk about. Um, Jessica, you were nominated for the Cri de Cor, which is the finale. Um, what was it like to uh, work with these incredible actors, but also capture uh, 
such a specific time in history. Olivia laughs. Yes, you're an incredible actor. Sorry. Um, it was. It was one of the things I loved about the finale in particular was we were we were now into the seventies, and so I felt that we had a lot. We had a bit of freedom to let the reins off, and also Margaret herself was breaking away. Just in this instance with Roddy, she was experience a kind. Ex, she just wanted to taste that freedom of being on the other side. And I thought Helena really went for that in the most beautiful way, but she was always pulled back by the weight of the position that she's in, just by the history and, and the, the, the kind of karmic path that she's on. She can never avoid, and in a way doesn't want to avoid her close association with the crown. But I love that it opened all of that up. And I thought that was a really fun time to explore. It was great. And it was just, look, it's a real gift. You get these two in a scene and it's magic. It's great. At times you're thinking, I really should come up with a good note, but actually I don't have much more to say. No, just... you always had brilliant things. I yes, used to be best thing. Always bang on with us. Yeah, amazing. And you made us exactly so much. Stop us from mucking about more. <laughs> yeah, and then actually he turned up on that big scene and we were just like, both me and Olivia said, great, why did you have to turn up on the big scene? Because it felt very good. Oh, yeah. And then, you were incredibly helpful because you cut half of it. Do you remember? Yeah. I, I <laughs> had no problem with cutting half of your... That was fantastic. You know, to, have a, to, have a, to have the showrunner and writer come in and go, we don't need all of this, I can see what they're doing, it's great. And, but also you've got actors that can manage that, but that doesn't freak them out. They're like, oh, brilliant. They saw that as a kind of freedom, it was great. Whereas for some people that's quite hard to make such a big adjustment in the shifts. Peter, I've heard that you cast the series before you actually write the scripts. Is that true? Um, well, that not not the first two series, and 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 I think I, I'm not sure it's entirely true. I, I think that there are one or two parts, you know, like the key parts, like the two women we're talking to today. I think I think both Olivia and Helena had been cast while I was still writing, um, but I'm not sure. Because Helena, you wanted to see something, didn't you? You wanted to read something, yeah, yeah. and and so, so I, I think there must have been scripts. You know, I could I could have obviously said to Helena, "Look, you've seen two seasons of it, and either you like it or you don't." You did and, say that. I didn't uh, say that. Did I, say that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, because you really because, were like what? Because, because you sort of <laughs> just just from a workload point of view, you're sort of saying. <laughs> Wait, wait a minute, wait, do I now have to write all 10 episodes before you say yes? Because we need to, you know, you need to obviously have some security about who the actors are going to be, you know, the key roles. You don't want to lose the people that you most want. And in both cases, they were our first choices. And so, you know, we, we, we didn't want to risk not getting our first choices. And, and, uh, and thanks to how brilliant their work is, um, uh, there are now actors for season five and season six who are signing on without seeing scripts because I'm frantic. Now, now we are I casting people now. without seeing scripts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, <laughs> uh, not one of them has had the bad manners to say, <laughs> can you send me, can you send me some scripts, please? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, but um, uh, so, so yes, in answer to your question, I mean, yes, we, we, we cast some people apart from Helena Bonham Carter, who, of course, was obstinate and critical. <laughs> it was more confidence, actually. He doesn't look at it. Now I can suddenly see it from your point of view, and it's incredibly insulting. But it was more diffidence than me thinking, well, how can I, can I play her? And then I saw it on the page and said, yeah. And it was Queen of Curves, a great episode. Actually, it's, le it's less about being insulting. It's more that I just, you know, I want to try and write them as well as I can. And if you're yeah. up against actors saying, can you please hurry up and get me scripts, then you're in a situation where you're, you're yeah, you're trying, you're rushing. Really annoying. I guess we'll never work again. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> you guys keep saying that. I think you're both going to work just fine. I'm not worried. Um, you know, when The Crown came out in 2016, it was an instant hit. And I'm curious, why do you think this, these stories and this family continue to resonate with people, even here in America? I say here in America, even though none of you are here, but I am, so. <laughs> well... I mean, they are extraordinarily well-known figures, you know, and um, I and and maybe I hope it's because because it's an easy subject to get wrong. Let's be honest, and 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 I'm not 
Uh, I mean, you know, look at me. I'm not a monarchist. I don't know what a monarchist would look like, but probably I'd have a hanky with here in my shirt pocket, and I'd have I'd have billowing grey hair, and I'd be wearing a, 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 a blazer with golden buttons, and, and I'd speak slightly differently. But but the um, uh, uh, there's something about the combination. There's something about using this particular family almost as avatars. Uh, uh, as a, as a, as you know, as a way of travelling through um, the second half of the twentieth century, and 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 that's what connects um, us and our parents and our children. For, for, for not just not just in this country, but in every country in the world, the Queen has been a sort of a constant, a constant figure. Everybody, you know, she has been one of the great, you know, public figures, certainly of the last, you know, seventy, eighty years, and. Uh, and, and so she's connective tissue for all of us internationally. You know, don't forget there are 3 billion people in the Commonwealth of 53 countries, um, that, you know, of whom she's at least notionally the head of state or, or you know. Um, so um, that's a lot, that, you know, that's a lot of connective tissue. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and then if you put that to one side and all the historical significance of it, um, it is just a family drama and, and, and a family, you know, and, 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 and the, the most satisfying, to me anyway, the most satisfying long running shows are the ones that are about families, whether, you know, whether it's The Sopranos or Succession or whatever it is, you know, the, 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 the internal wranglings within a family, um, you know, whether it's Proust or whichever way you want to go, it, 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 it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a joy for a writer, and 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 the, they they have exactly the same problems as any other multi generational family, and yet they're quite different to any other multi generational family because of of what the responsibility is for the person at the very centre of it, and of course there's also that thing, uh, not dissimilar to Succession. In fact, uh, in in some ways, this show could be called Succession too. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it is about the murderous, in you know, desire uh, almost of one person to have, and and also when I thought when Helen was talking just then about Princess Margaret feeling small and always wanting, I don't think she'd have been. She's no big. She was not really any smaller than her sister, and her well, sister has never. Well, maybe fra maybe no, fractionally, but I no, I do. I I do I do think yeah I think it has a lot to do with being well, second and not being queen. Mm. Yeah. You know, wanting, a few, wanting a few extra inches to be noticed, that in itself is a sort of a, a succession totally. issue. Yeah. I would like to point out that you were first, so technically you would be succession one, and uh, yeah. it would be succession two. <laughs> no, I, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's just a family and power dramas within a family, and... Uh, we and they and none of us will be the first and the last people to do it. That will go on being the staple of hopefully great drama, you know, um, forever and ever. People uh, are, are so fascinated by this character who's also a real person. Do they want to sort of talk to you about Queen Elizabeth II? Uh, well, I don't go out, so that, that helps. <laughs> and, um, and my friends don't. So the only people I see are my friends. It's only when we do press people ask me questions about it because... Uh, I, I don't know what the answer. We're making it up, you know. It's a we're making a drama with these people as a sort of um, starting point, I suppose. So, if I if I was answering questions on her behalf, I, I would be totally making it up because I. Um, so yeah, no, people don't ask me unless unless it's in this but situation. You have to know that Olivia is the most reluctantly famous person in the world, and if you go <laughs> anywhere in public, she's mm -hmm. under about seven baseball caps. She's hunched. She's almost like ridiculously more inconspicuous, and it's like total embarrassment. I've never actually—it was—it's a phenomenon in itself. So, have you uh, have you found have you found mask wearing helps? I love mask wearing. I uh, love so, do, so does Chilean. She's now uh, she, yeah. she 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 uh, she likes bicycles and mask wearing because she puts a helmet on, the mask on, yeah. and she's everywhere. She's everywhere. Yeah. You can't stop her. She's gone shopping. She's doing everything now. And uh, the mask is the mask has released her. What? Yeah, I absolutely love it because yeah. I can wear a baseball cap, sunglasses because it's summer, and a mask. I can go anywhere. It's <laughs> lovely. So Some I've been into shops like for the first time in years. My husband's very grateful because I always, please, can you go? I don't want to go to the shop. So um, <laughs> I love it. Whole new lease of life. 
Uh, before we go, um, I know that you've already filmed season four. Um, is there anything you can preview uh, that we can expect from that season? Well, Just I mean, it, you know, I, yes, I can. I mean, you know, Jess was also absolutely instrumental to that season, and she also uh, directed the finale of that one. Um, it is very much the queen in a um, in a sandwich of uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Thatcher on the one side, Princess Diana on the other, and M Margaret just one step off as well. So it's uh, it's it's a it's a season full of very strong women. I cannot wait. How did you get Gillian Anderson for Margaret Thatcher? She's amazing. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> How did that happen? I, I, well, actually, I'll tell you how that happened. That really, I t that happened with me thinking, you know, oh my God, is this mad? And then, I so I asked her. I asked her if, she, if I, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I asked her if I thought she could do it. And and with the really good actors, the really really good actors, they will just tell you that that you know. I might think they could do it, but if they can't, if they couldn't do it, and, and no, none, no great actor that needs work will want to fall flat on their face. And so she said, let me think about it. And then about a week later, she said, yeah, I think I can do it. And so then I, so then I knew she could do it, but I didn't want the cast or any of the fellow producers to think this had been in some way, you know, cooked up here at home. And, uh, and so I rang Nina Gold, uh, our casting director, and I said... I've had an idea for Thatcher, uh, 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 Gillian, what do you think? And because if, if she, uh, and then she said, I think it's a fabulous idea. And I said, would it be your first idea? Because if it isn't your first idea, we must explore what your first idea was. And she said, and she get, again, took a couple of days and came back and said, Gillian would be her first idea. And you can't persuade Nina anything. <laughs> anything. So, uh, uh, so actually in the end, Gillian would have been our first choice with or without any connection. I mean, and she was the best choice. She was unbelievable. I agree. Really outstanding. Phenomenal. I cannot wait. Um, I want to congratulate you guys on a fantastic third season. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Love to see you all.